here's what I can promise anybody listening who just goes, man, I don't know where to start with this. This is what I would tell them. The great news is, is that the need to be a compelling preacher on Sunday morning, the need to be a super leader on Monday morning in staff meeting, all of those things are your responsibility, right? But when we realize it's not our weight to carry and we're invited into those things, we're drawing from the source, which is God, but we're not doing it because we have to, or we have to keep this thing moving. This is what kills pastors, man. This is why we see suicide rates starting to spike amongst pastors is because they feel that this spoken and unspoken aspect of their elders, their deacons, their congregations, their own hurts and wounds, the, all that stuff to keep this thing going and go bigger, better, more awesome. My name is Timothy Eldred. Today on the show, I talked to my friend, David Martin. David serves today as the lead pastor of Grace Point West in San Antonio, Texas. In the decade plus that I've known him, I have watched him navigate some challenging waters in ministry as he's transitioned from pastoral ministry to I am second to back to pastoral ministry. And in that time, there've been some real battles, battles that I think will resonate with your heart. So please listen carefully, listen with a willingness to learn. Welcome to the Authentic Pastor Podcast. Dude, I have been looking forward to this. I've been counting down the days myself. I don't get out much anymore, so this is a, this is a big deal. <laughs> Just to see somebody. Just to see another <laughs> human being, yes. You know, we always say, um, we're just going to have a conversation. Here's what happens. Like we have a conversation before we hit record. And then we have a conversation after the recording stops and the conversation before and after is a real conversation, but somehow we go into pastor mode because we know we're on stage. Right. I mean, it's just a conversation with a couple cameras, but no matter what, we're wired, and I don't know if this is just everybody, I think it's everybody, but maybe pastors in particular, maybe not, that as soon as that camera is rolling or that mic is hot, we we dial it down just a little bit because somebody's listening. So, I mean, we just finished a podcast a little bit ago, and Kelton said, you know that conversation you had afterwards? Why didn't you have that conversation during the conversation? Right. So you and I aren't going to do that. We've got too much longevity to to go into pastor mode. So, you know, what is it like something be damned? We're just going to do it. Just going to do it and let the chips fall where they may. I like it. <laughs> Let's do it, man. Let's do it. Let's do it. I, I think part of the, part of it, to be fair, is not, we're not wanting to be fake or be showy, but we are in some ways performers, right? So there's a muscle memory that kicks into gear where you just need to be on to give a good interview or to make sure the lighting's right or all the rest of those types of things. And I think that just competes in the background, right? So yeah. the disclaimer yeah. on the front end, um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to take off my shirt. I'm going to be an authentic guy today. I'm just going to hang out. You can wear your shirt, just lose the, lo lose the pants. Oh, baby, those were off 10 minutes ago. <laughs> got a hat, <laughs> got a shirt, naked the rest of the way down. That's it, dressed from the waist up. You know, that's it. it's really interesting because I use the word naked when I talk about authenticity. You, know, you could use transparency, vulnerability, or the whole bit, but the uh, we are afraid. We're afraid to expose ourselves. Mm. You know, I mean, I don't want to see your junk, but we're afraid to expose ourselves. And there is, um, you're right. It could be muscle memory, you know, mental memory, uh, the performer in us, um, because I think all pastors are performers. You and I are particularly performers and, um, it could be professionalism, you know, make a pretty spin on it and call it professionalism. But I've been doing this long enough. And so have you to know that as afraid as we are of letting people see uh, 
beneath the surface. They really want to see beneath the surface. Mm -hmm. It can backfire. I mean, we've seen it backfire. I've had it backfire in my life where people are like, they don't want to know that much information. Right. And yet, if I don't give them the full unfettered access, how do I possibly help them live an authentic life in Christ every day without the hypocrisy that the church is accused of um, propagating? I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know. And that's why I think, you know, this, this authentic pastor project is so important yeah. for, for clergy is because that's where we really want to help people get to. Mm -hmm. But maybe, maybe we're our own worst enemies. I don't know. Well, that's, that's definitely loaded. We can go one of 80 different directions in that. But what comes to my mind is that the term authenticity, right? That's a subjective term um, for many people, right? So there's, I think there's a difference, and we get into this, but I think there's a difference between bleeding out, right? Um, and all you see is the blood. You don't see the person. Right. Mm -hmm. If you see someone who's tremendously injured and that is a horrific sight, it causes people to recoil to go. I don't even know what to do with that. I think someone who would even care about us and see us in that state would go, man, I don't even know how to fix that or respond to that uh, for fear of dishonoring it or diminishing it and that sort of thing. And so I think folks run the opposite direction. So I think there's a responsibility within authenticity. I think that there's it's not just free for all, hey, take it or leave it. Because I, no, I, I don't think, it, I don't think it can be. It, it shouldn't be. I don't think that's authenticity. Um, I think that's just, look at me, could be selfish. Uh, could, I mean, there's, there's reasons why that, that, that can happen, but there's liabilities that come with that. So I think you're right. There has to be a, there has to be an awareness, a self-awareness of word. what authenticity is, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and be able to and I'm, it's going to sound like I'm over-spiritualizing it, but I, I've, I've run the spectrum. So I, I've been on both ends of this thing. I've been tremendously guarded, um, really uh, focused on how I present myself, right? Those are things that we're taught. These are things that we learn how to play the game, especially when we're young in ministry. We're climbing up all the rest of those things. But then I went all the way to the other side. And there is some great liberating factors of living authentic, an authentic life, right? An open book, no secrets. It's a wonderful place to be, and I love living there, and I do live there. But you have to meet people at the level they're willing and able to receive that. Yeah. Otherwise, it gets lost, and then we can feel like people don't understand us. Oh, I'm just being authentic, and that's too real for someone, which I think that's a false bottom. So I... I, I Probably brought up a couple things there, but that, that's my first thought. Well, I, I don't think people, first of all, whether they're talking about their pastor or even a close friend, they don't always want to see your garbage. You know, it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. How many times you have a real conversation with somebody and they ask you how you are, right, generally, and you really tell them. And they clam up like, oh, Okay, well, you know, God bless you. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, I hope you get better. Um, yeah. I, I gotta go. And maybe that's David because we're uncomfortable with our own authenticity. How can you deal with somebody else's crap if you don't know how to even acknowledge your own? Yeah. And and maybe that's part. Of, maybe that's part of the problem is generally speaking, from a human perspective, we don't know how to be 100% honest with ourselves. Maybe ever. Yeah, maybe ever. So, I mean, I think I'm getting better at it. I am not an expert in this podcast. Um, 
what I'm learning how to do is learning to talk about not my authenticity, my inauthenticity, because I think that's uh, the beginning. If you can't, you can't fix what you don't admit. So I have to admit those areas in my life where I feel like I am not true to self. I tell you what you want to hear because um, I care what you think. I probably care what you think more than I care what I think about myself. And it becomes this, this battle. And it, it's a, it's a real struggle, especially when you're in professional ministry, because you're supposed to be, like we right. said before, leading some place people to a place where across the street that we don't know how to cross. And if we're not careful, we'll get somebody killed in the midst of doing it. Mm -hmm. So, which it goes back to your statement about self-awareness. I, I, why does self-awareness matter to you? What does self-awareness look like? First of all, why does it matter? Well, I mean, being self-aware, I think, is the first step towards becoming authentic, right? Um, it requires an honesty and a revelation of just who you are and what you're not. And then I'll just speak for myself. I won't speak in general terms. But let's be honest. There are things that we don't like about ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, from the time that we were young, right, if someone took a picture of us, the first person that we looked for in that picture, if it was a group photo, was ourselves. And then we have to, then we size up, right? Um, but just a, a minute, not when, I, not when I'm younger, I still do it. it exactly. I've like, got a picture. What... Actually, I've got a picture of you and I and Louis Giglio and Eric Samuel, Tim, we're standing uh -huh. backstage. And the first thing I notice in that picture, first of all, we're all wearing black because we all know as stage presenters that black carries, yeah, I know, look at this. Black carry, <laughs> you know, covers a multitude of sins. Right, And then I'm looking at myself going, dang, I look fatter than Louis Giglio. And I'm not. <laughs> Louis, Louis pudgy. You know, hope he listens to this. And um, <laughs> and that was the first thing I saw was, oh, man, don't be the first one in the front of the camera and don't be standing sideways anymore. Right. So yeah. we're always we're always <laughs> looking. I haven't even outgrown that in 52 years. So no, no. And, and neither have I. Right. Um but but the point that I was making with that is that we immediately measure ourselves based upon those around us, and then we determine how, where do we fit into that. Um, you know, and so yeah, Giglio looked he looked great, um, but you know we could all lose a couple pounds. But the only person I was looking for was myself. First. Well, thanks. That was kind. That made me look like that made me look like an idiot. You know. <laughs> But th by me, but that but my point is this: you're self-aware. In that moment, you're aware of something you don't like. So then we have to make a decision. What am I going to do? And, and this is a very base example, but I think it speaks to the spirit of what we're talking about. The way, then we go. Okay, then how do I position myself through life to look better in pictures? Mm -hmm. But that that is a transferable mindset to absolutely any everything. And everything. Right. So let's fast forward to leading a church, right? So me standing sideways, feeling a little bit puffy that day, it could be church attendance compared to the other three churches that are up the road. Right. Right. So it's all of a sudden. So in that moment, it's tough because you see what you don't like. Then you go, how can I compensate for that? Or do I go, hmm, you know what? I'm the individual in that picture. I can only represent myself. I need to be fine with where I'm at and who I am and work towards becoming better, but not so that I can look better with the other four people in the picture. No, self-awareness. So going right. to self-awareness, I think, is what it, it requires us to do that. But you have to make peace with it. And I think if you're able to make peace with your inadequacies, your weaknesses, perceived or real, then that allows you the authority to be more authentic um, because you're not using the stage or groups of people as a therapy session, right? But you're speaking to what you're not, and then it ties into identity in Christ. I mean, that's where I go. I agree. And so it really comes down to what I heard you saying was, what is my motivation for self-awareness? Yeah. 
so unpacking that just a minute, it's not so that I can compare myself and look better than David in the photo. It's self-awareness is necessary to take control of my life because then I can make adjustments without self-awareness. How can I adjust anything? But again, it's got to be about becoming the best version, the best authentic self that God designed me to be, not who God designed me to be compared to who he designed you to be. Right. Because that, that little fork in the road will determine you just jump on another treadmill, right? You just take another journey to further bondage, further insecurity, or if you, that self-awareness allows, allows you to go this direction, freedom, Mm. freedom. And, and it's, it's not being owned by the things that the world says that you're not or the mirror tells you. And so when you're able to walk in freedom, there's a confidence that comes up that affords you the ability, I think, to be more authentic because you're not worried about the liability anymore. Liability being people's atten- uh, you know, opinions of you. Or let's be real honest, your paycheck, your livelihood, um, these types of things. I have found early on when I started this whole journey as a pastor, I was authentic with the things that I had already defeated and had overcome. But for a pastor who maybe is listening to this, it is the stakes are so high to be authentic in the process. And I think there's two different things there. Um, It's one thing to talk about a story and you put a bow on it and go, I used to be that, but now I'm living an authentic life. Great. Well, you you bypassed all the liabilities, right? But if you're in the middle of that, I think that's where the fear, that's where the secrecy, that's where all those things really show up because they try to bark you down. They try to keep you from walking into that because there may be a paycheck on the line. There may be a marriage on the line. There may be other things that that it's just the stakes feel so high that you go, I want to live authentic, but I guess I can't. And so in the mind of a pastor, because I've walked those roads, you go, well, then now there's this duality where mm-hmm. I'm one person here, but if the peop- if people knew the real Pastor David Martin, they would be appalled. Well, it wrecks, your, rep- it wrecks your reputation. It, and so it while, I know, while I know there, it can, and I know the, the, the tangible parts of it, the title, the paycheck, the um, applause, all of those feed, things feed into my my ego, right? Mm-hmm. We all have an egoic part of ourselves. And so if you really know who I am, like I could even live without a paycheck. I could make less money. I can take a role someplace else. But at the end of the day, what do you think about? What do you think about me? Right. Because that, talk about puffy, that puffs up. You know, mm-hmm. when I'm just talking about Tim standing sideways in the photo, that puffs up and it's um, self-inflated, manufactured. And sometimes it's the only thing that keeps me going is what I, what I want you to think about me. Because then if I, if you feel good about me, if you have great, you know, applause and uh, affinity towards me, then it compensates for the parts of me that I don't like. And I think compensate is the right word because we reward that. We as a society or culturally speaking, we reward people who have found a life hack to be able to present themselves in a way that looks like they have no issues, problems, hurts, habits, hangups, right? We reward that. We call them influencers, you know, so we don't see the 41 pictures they took before they posted the 42nd picture or whatever that looks perfect. And so we applaud that with likes and follows. And then people say, sponsor our stuff. And, and I, I, please hear me. I'm not knocking social. I'm just simply saying our culture rewards that. And so if you could find a way to find a hack to be able to present yourself in a way as authentic and perfect at the same time, that is what I see this generation and, and really, when I say generation, several generations of ministry leaders, right. we have fallen into this. Um, and, and so because we're compensated for it. So there's actually a reward for being inauthentic or finding a way to appear authentic and not have any authenticity whatsoever. 
That's really interesting that we re, we do. We reward inauthenticity more than authenticity. Right. So yesterday, last night, full transparency, I had posted um, a picture on Instagram. And the response was so abysmal. I was even embarrassed. And I thought it was some of my best stuff. And I got like a handful of likes on it. What did I do? I took that crap down. Absolutely. Because uh-huh. I don't want yeah. you to ever go to my page and go, well, who's that guy? No one pays mm-hmm. attention to him. You know, 1.7 people liked it. So I, I get the 0.7 person, the non-human, right? The bot. <laughs> You got the bot from me. <laughs> I got the bot, like my stuff. I took it down yesterday because I don't want people to think. So what? that's completely inauthentic instead of just going, hey, I thought it was good. You didn't think it was good. I don't really care what you think because I care what you think. Right. This has been a heck of a journey for me. So I, I hear what you're saying. I really do because in 2018, if you want to get into this a little bit, In 2018, uh, the conference that we're at was the one that I put on uh, with Louis Giglio, Eric Samuel, Tim, Tim Eldred, all the all the cool kids. Right. And it was a great conference Um, in the interest and I in the interest of being authentic. The last session of that conference, here's what happened. And I'm going somewhere. Um, I got on stage. I began to preach about Esther, the name, the the tie or the the. The concept for that particular conference that year was living fearlessly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I understand, I know my audience. I'm fully aware of what I say and how I say things on stage. I'm not a loose cannon. I, everything is pretty much premeditated, but I really sense the religious spirit in that room, that particular session that night, it was the closing session. And I felt in my spirit that I needed to rattle the cage a little bit, not for to be sensational or provocative or to be irreverent, but to speak to the reality of, of what students and teens in this, in this generation are facing when it comes to living in fear. It's such a, a thing, right? So I'm preaching about Esther. And what I was talking about is as I was introducing her and just kind of giving a bio, I was like, this is nowhere in scripture does it say that she was smart doesn't say that she uh, had an education. All we see in this story is that she was stunningly beautiful. I said, so on the front end, what we do is we, we look at people based upon their appearance, their externals. All anyone saw was just a woman who had all the right curves in all the right places. That's it. I went on to explain, I said, but what we're about to find is that what is inside this woman She doesn't even know is there, but what we're going to find out is there is a warrior, someone who's willing to stand up and be willing to die for the right things. There's a fearless spirit within her, but all people saw was a pretty face. That's all I said. There was a group of people that lost their freaking minds. So this is in 2018. I was one of the first people to get canceled. When I made that statement, all they could hear was all the right curves, all the right places. That's very irreverent. That's almost like a sexist statement to make. Okay. All right. Well, let's just pretend that's not a reality in our culture and it's been around since day one. Okay. Well, what happened is there was an email campaign the day after. I'm I'm feeling like this was the best conference I've ever been a part of. And there was a campaign. I did not and, know this, man, because I thought well, it was the best conference I'd been part of. Me too. Although I flew out and skipped your last session because I had better things to do. Well, if you had stuck around, you would have been, you would have been offended. So um, it's good that you left, but here's the thing. So there was an email campaign and I'm not joking. It was hundreds and hundreds of emails and it was instigated by two, two people in particular, but they started this thing. So I'm in the office of the lead pastor a month later and he goes, David, gifted communicator. Thank you for what you've done for us. Uh, But for a pastor, he said, there's two, there's two things that can happen when someone needs to transition off staff. It it, it comes to the person who goes to the pastor and says, I feel like God is leading me elsewhere. Or the pastor goes, you know what? I see that you need to go. He said, it's going to be the latter. 
he said, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you eight months. We're going to pay you. We're going to let you finish out the rest of the year. Um, but you're not going to lead Dustbo Conference anymore. You're not going to lead the Leadership Academy anymore. You're not going to lead the student ministry anymore. And so basically for the next eight months, because I had no idea what was next. I, didn't, I had no idea where I was going. Um, I sat in my office eight hours a day. And it was like a jail cell. It was like a work release program where I would, I would leave and go home and live my life and then come back to my jail cell every single day. There's a lot to that. We can get into that. But here's, here's where I'm going with this. I had eight months to sit in that office and do nothing and think and really hurt, really hurt because it felt so unfair. And it, and it, and it was in many ways. Um, this is what happens when things can be taken out of context and people are fearful and, you know, I get all those types of things. So talking about authenticity, I was real in that moment and I stand by what I said because I wanted to make a point. Um, and the point was, is obviously what I already made, but I went, you know, I've been playing the social media game, just talking about with it. That's where it led me. I've been playing the social media game, just like you wanting to make sure that I'm in the right pictures with the right people wanting to make sure, hey, I'm promoting myself, come bring me in to speak, do all those things, right? Because I'm building a platform and this is a ministry and I had a national ministry. I had a national influence at that point. And I went, you know what? I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. So if you look at my social media from 2018 moving forward, it looks like your grandma is posting. All I post are pictures that are meaningful to me that I take with my phone <laughs> and Bible verses. Now I'm not I'm not principalizing this and saying everybody needs to do this. But no, I'm there was a there was a there was a distinct shift. Now I walked with you through the transition of where you are today and got to be yeah. part of that and hear oh, yeah. how God had led you there. Mm -hmm. I was not aware. No, I'm mad at you. I mean, I love you, but doggone it. The I'm not mad. I'm sorry you went through. I'm sorry you went through that, but I actually am not because I think it probably was a, a, a stepping stone towards a, a, a better version of David Martin. Not that there was anything wrong with the last one, but a great, a great stepping stone. And I remember in the social media accounts watching you post like serious pieces of scripture with a white background and just the text. Am I right? Yeah. Yes, sir. And, and, and they were powerful because it was just, it wasn't anything else than the word of God. And there was a distinct move in what you posted. So yeah. anyway, I wanted to acknowledge that I did see that. No. Well, and that would, that was me going, I'm not playing this game anymore. And if anything has any meaning whatsoever, in my opinion, it's going to be the word of God. And so for me, that was an exercise and that I've continued. And so I divested myself from the burden of having to make sure that I'm still keeping a, the cool, the, the next picture and making sure that I get enough likes. And if I don't get enough likes, I take it down because that's embarrassing. I get all that. And I understand why we do that. I mean, there's actually some wisdom behind that to a degree, depending on what you're wanting to do. But in that process of this dark night of the soul for me, I did not know if there was another path for me forward in ministry. Um, because I really, I was one of the first people to get canceled. I got canceled, man. Like the people, my team, people on my staff, I had 15 people on my staff and where my office was situated, it was by the exit in our building, and they would just walk by. They wouldn't come into my office. Oh, they don't want right? to be, you know, collateral damage. No way. And I get it. I understand that because to be associated with me, I'm not I'm not overstating this. To be associated with me means that you could also get it too. So I fully understand. I didn't hold that against them, but it was so painful because these are people that I loved and led, and all of a sudden I'm just this pariah for the next eight months. At this, at this church. And but let me just back up. I honor Pastor Brady. I honor New Life Church. I really do. And I'm, it had to happen. It had to happen because of where the point that I'm going to make. I went, who am I in that season? Am I still called? Do I still have a voice to anybody or anything? Is the Lord done? I was starting to pull up. I, was, I, I remember one night I was sitting on the front porch of my house, just so depressed and broken hearted, man. And I typed in how to get your real estate license in Google. Okay. This is where I was at. And the Holy Spirit said, do not hit that link. Do not do that. And I'm like, well, then my, my freaking hands are tied, man. I don't know what's next. And, uh, 
what the Lord did in that season is he showed me something. I don't have to do anything for him. He doesn't need me to do anything for him. And that may sound super simple to everybody else, but that was a profound moment for me because I think there was a part of me to be successful is to honor the Lord and say, look, Lord, what I've done for you. And what I found out and what he showed me is I've already rung the bell in the sense I'm a child. I'm a son of God. There's no higher anything that I get. There's not enough likes on the planet that's going to be able to compete with that. And so then I will well, shoot. Lord, I'll do whatever you, I don't care. I don't care. I don't need the, the limelight. I don't need the stage. I don't need followers. I don't need any of this stuff. And what that afforded me was liberty because I no longer had to play a game in order to be relevant or anything else. I was simply able to be a child of God. And that's it. And so any success that comes after that, whatever it's shaped Just a form, bonus. Just, just a bonus. I, I just go, thank you for inviting me into it. But he's going to do it anyway. I mean, so you know a bit about like when I was turning 50, I, um, I hit a wall. I hit a wall of my own making. I was so busy being and becoming um, in 30 years of ministry that I was still attempting to, you know, make a name, make a difference, um, be a household idea and name in the, especially then the youth ministry world. Mm -hmm. And um, continue to add my frequent flyer miles, you know, and travel the world. At the same time, we're going through COVID and I'm going through some serious, serious health issues. Mm -hmm. And so I came to a point where, my wall was different than, you know, your canceled wall, um, where I was just done. I was just done. I was going to, I mean, I submitted my resignation to a church I'd served at the time for 25 years. And I said, I'm done with ministry. I don't want to do this anymore. What I didn't do is dig deep enough to recognize that it wasn't ministry that was the problem. It was me. Mm -hmm. It was me. So we do that. We blame something else instead of looking deep inside. And so I went through six months of, I'm not praying. I'm not getting in the word. You know, people will criticize me for this statement, but I would get up Sunday after Sunday and preach one heck of a sermon that I didn't prep for at all. Because as you know, I can get up, you can get up. Most pastors can get up and preach and we don't even need the Holy Spirit to do anything because we are so yeah. professional. We are so polished. And um, I would sit in my office and I would tell God, I'm not talking to you today. And he would say, you just did. Dang, right. got, got me foiled again. Right. <laughs> and um, I went through a dark, dark, dark night of the soul. And um, for like half a year of hundreds of nights until I finally got to that point to recognize in my anger, uh, in my brokenness, that God had not changed one, his love for me one bit. And I don't know exactly when it was and the moment it was. It's not in my journal. But sitting in this same office that I'm in right now to just feel, didn't hear God, there was no writing on the wall, feel God say, you're fine. You're fine. Which is actually about the same moment that God said, you want to talk about authenticity? Fine. You want to talk to a different crowd than the church? Fine. But you're not going to until you start talking to pastors. Hmm. You're not leaving your peers and your colleagues behind what you're hmm. learning and so, yeah, I've, like, I went from flying 150 days a year, globe trotting, to making a very significant living to, like, I can't stand getting on a plane anymore. And I'm living on 80% less income. And I've never felt better about who I am because either I chose to or I was forced to, again, by my wall of my own making let go 
of things. And I would say today my ministry is not, it's not bigger. I'm not reaching thousands of people for Jesus every day or every week or every month. But the depth is so fulfilling mm. because of the liberty and freedom that came through a tough lesson. And I think that's what I think that's what you're talking about. Absolutely. Here's here's what I think, though, on the back end of that. It's not to discount what we were doing before. I personally think it's God's extravagant way of leading us to those moments because of our wiring, whatever, whatever it is, right? And using us within the, our dysfunction, our immaturity, our lack of perspective, authenticity, whatever it may be. I think it was all absolutely God's plan to get us to this point. I think for me, you know how Rick Warren opens up, you know, with Purpose Driven and says it's not about you. And I understand what he's saying there. But equally, it is absolutely all about you when it comes to your relationship and the love of the Father. And he will use all of these things and allow you to be around the globe in 150 days, all of those things. Because I promise, tell me if I'm wrong, but in those years where you were doing that, you felt the goodness of God. You Absolutely. knew God, right? You knew his favor was on you. He'd given you the Even capacity. if my motivation wasn't 100% accurate. Right, right. That's he right. still he still used, and I knew that I was in his favor, even when I knew sometimes my motivation was um, of my flesh. And within that, he knew that, and still chose to do it, not in spite of you, but to reach you. And so I I don't think that that is oh we got it wrong here and we got it right here. I think it's just part of the whole journey, quite honestly. Okay, so I want to take you back a few years. Because I wonder, not putting words in your mouth and not trying to connect all the dots, I wonder about your journey for the last decade since we first mm -hmm. met. Hmm. There was a wrestling even then. Mm -hmm. I remember you contacting me and going, I just read a chapter of your book and I quit my job. Like, That's right. What are you doing, man? Don't blame me for quitting your job. <laughs> burn the book. You know, burn the right. book. It's a dribble. I wrote it. <laughs> but you left pastoral ministry. Yeah. In, I mean, I mean, official pastoral ministry and stepped right. into yeah. and stepped into a role with I am second. Mm -hmm. And we're very good at it. Doing the student element of I am second. And loved it. Mm -hmm. And then along the way, you left I Am Second, stepped back into a pastoral ministry, and then with the story you just told with New Life, and then stepped into now God has put you in another pastoral ministry. Isn't it all the same story in some ways of a reshaping of David? Yeah, man. Not to play Dude, counselor I, here, because I'm not that. Yeah. I'm just hearing, because I uh, know more of the history, like, there are people who will listen to our conversation and they will think that they can implement one, two or three things and they'll make this transition this year. This mm -hmm. will be their 2023 resolution to become authentic and get the certificate to hang on their wall that says they're authentic. When that process sometimes is long, arduous, painful, confusing, all leading someplace, right? All leading someplace, but not necessarily in the timing we want. And so we abandon it only mm -hmm. to go through darker nights of the soul. Yeah. Is there a question in that? Well, it's, it's not, it's not me being therapist. I'm just, I'm just wondering, for, I'm just wondering. Yeah. Do you do you see the same process playing out over 10 years in different ways? Well, for some reason you asking that question makes me want to cry. Uh so you you touched you touched something very deep in me in that question is why I asked that. Um yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It's it's really interesting that you frame it that way because I never thought of it like that. But when I was 39, 
uh, about to turn 40, God said, I want you to do a 40 day fast leading into your 40th birthday. And I did. And one of the things that came from that was his very clear call on my life that there was a greater scope of ministry that he was wanting me to step into. And whatever that looked like, right? But more national travel, speak, preach, what I, but I didn't know what that looked like. But my heart was to say yes. And at the time I was a student pastor, loved great youth ministry, thriving, things were going well. Another huge thing that came from that fast was me reconciling with my father, who I hadn't had contact with for 20 years. And God told me on my 40th birthday, he said, David, don't drag this stuff into your 40s. You need to call your dad and release him. So I did. And I wasn't expecting anything back. This was not some sort of way to be able to get dad back in my life. It was not that. I just, this is what God said. He said, you don't want to say these things to a tombstone. Do it while he's still alive. And I was like, done. So I did. And so there's these great cathartic things that came from this fast and vision. But that was going into 2012. Um, I thought this was going to be my year. 2012 was the year where I got broken down because... <laughs> Uh, talking about authenticity. The thing is, is I had a pornography addiction that was very robust um, in the sense that I was on three, four, five times a week. Um, yet the ministry that I'm leading is growing and I'm hearing from the Lord and my sermons are anointed. And so there's this weird thing. And Balance. I was like, yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, is I wasn't walking in unrepentance. I hated it. I mm -hmm. hated that this was something that I was dealing with. Um, Absolutely couldn't. It, it just it wrecked me in so many different ways. But 2012, I kept hearing, this is every man's struggle. This is every man's battle. This is just a foregone thing for every male. You if just didn't write, you just didn't write the book. I just didn't write the book. That's exactly. right. You didn't get the royalties off the book. No, but I bought into it. And and I'm not saying he's Eldridge, Eldridge is wrong. I think no, no, it's no. Eldridge. Who, who wrote it? Not uh, Eldred. No, no, not Eldred. I have Jonathan, a funny Jonathan, I have a funny story about that. Our, our starts with an A. Anyway. Anyway, that dude. Um 2012 was the year that the Lord broke that out of me. And it was a very hard process. And we could talk about that if you want to, but um there was a wrestling. And so when 20 so the end of 2012, it was October or November, I put an application as a as a student pastor, Justin Stephen, Knowles. And I, Stephen Stephen Arterburn. Is that who it is? Stephen Arterburn. Never would have arrived at that name. So I, I Googled it. So Justin Knowles, you know, Justin, I do. He, uh, he and I connected via Twitter. We became buddies. There was this stuff that Marco was doing. The open Boston was one of them. And so, you know, it's kind of an open source thing. You submit your stuff, you, you know, send in your little talk and then maybe you get chosen. You can come and present, which is where you and I met. And uh, anyway, Justin Knowles and I wrote this this little thing about small groups. Um, it was my first ray of light that I was actually going to still be used by God because that process I thought was going to disqualify me. God breaking the pornography addiction out of my life. That's when you and I met. You talked. I fell in love with you immediately. I'm like, I have to meet this guy. You give me your book, Pray 21. I go back at the beginning of the school or this beginning of the year of 2013 I start going through it because I wanted to see if I wanted to take my students through it to make sure it wasn't heretical or something weird. And it wrecked me. And I can't remember which chapter it is, but write down the things that if you could basically have a blank check, what would you ask the Lord? And I was just like, God, I've been praying about this for a year. I feel like it's, I'm not going anywhere. This isn't going to happen anyway. And he's like, do it again. And so in my office, I wrote down the things in your book. This is what I feel God's called me to do. This is what I want to do. And then it was at that point, in that devotional, he said, now it's time. And I quit my position shortly after that. And then the rest, we are off to the races. So to go back to your original point that you made, you're right. There are these seasons of success from our terms, loneliness, brokenness, desperation, healing, next thing. And you're right, man. There is a bit of a trend in my world in the last decade, isn't there? But each one, by God's grace, I've made it to the other side, better, more complete and whole and self-aware um, than I was the previous season. And so that's why I can't look at my time at New Life, going back to that, 
with any disdain or no. feeling like there was injustice or anything right. because I, I'm thankful I would go through it again as much as that sucked. You know, I've said that so many times that um, I went through a decade of living in chronic pain. And in those moments of pain, I've never been more dependent upon God. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I battled the Lord in those seasons. And the more I battled instead of submitted, I feel like it was more prolonged. Not all of a sudden when I submitted, God healed me, you know, because God's healing came through surgery five discs and lots of procedures. This current situation that I'm going with, you know, with this nerve disorder and this brain aneurysm um, is easier than that. And I've said in all of those, I wouldn't change a thing. And I think that's part of the self-awareness, some of the self-care to go, you always have to feel a bit of pain in order to experience some growth, but we avoid pain. Maybe that's why we avoid authenticity because we're afraid of the pain. Even if we endured the pain of a dwindling of our reputation, a change in career, uh, moving on, moving up, moving out of ministry to something different, letting go of the tried, true routine, the comfort. We're missing out on amazing growth and blessing because we don't trust God. You know, it sounds like a big, you know, audacious statement. We don't trust God, so we stick with it. But it's okay to admit in our in our humanity that we have doubts that God will come through. That's why we play Jesus. That's why we're out to change the world, save the world, even though Jesus already saved the whole freaking world. We feel like we still have to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's the great that's the great commission. We have to do it. Because if we don't do it, It'll never get done because God's not big enough to carry it by himself, right? Like mm -hmm. you already said, I think you used the phrase, he rung the bell. The bell's already been rung. You know, finish line's already been crossed. Right. And I just, I'm just wondering, I mean, in our conversation, if that's the same reason we hold on to um, behaviors, insecurities, failing of ins insufficiency instead of releasing it and going, okay, God, uh, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you in this, even though it makes no sense as up and down this roller coaster to look back a decade later as you have, as I have and go, man, that was hell. I go through hell again. It was worth it. But in order to really live with authenticity as a pastor, oh, man, when we consider the cost, we're going, can't do it. I will continue to play the game. Yeah. I'll continue to play the game before I lose my reputation, before I lose my job, before I lose my paycheck, before I lose my marriage. All of those are very real possibilities. But the alternative is so much, so much better. Now that I'm asking anyone listening to go, yeah, throw it all away. No, there's right. a process you can follow. There, there's a process. I mean, that's why we're doing the authentic pastor to try to lead, you know, men and women in ministry through a process. But yeah, you've got me thinking now. If, if there's a, for the pastors listening and they're like, oh my gosh, you know, they're just living vicariously through these stories that have worked out well, right, on the other side of pain. And there is that fear, right? The fear of all the things. But let's talk about what those things are. Title, right? 
and these are legitimate fears. So I want to just affirm. They that. are legitimate fears. So for anyone listening, we 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 are not discounting these. We have no. went through these, David and I. Absolutely. So title, position, check, paycheck, financial stability, relationships with our kids, with our spouse, friends, coworkers, whatever those things are. Um, calling. And all of these things, though, really, if we don't, if we don't, I've learned, I'll speak for myself, what I learned is all of these things, though, shape an identity, mm-hmm. right? They, 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 they round us out. They, they legitimize us in many ways, right? And on some level, it's, it's totally understandable. So to go, if I'm authentic and I'm willing to enter into this process, right, with the Holy Spirit, who am I if I if these if I don't have these things? Yeah. And it really is an identity thing, in my opinion. And the only way you can discover who you are with these things is be willing to lay them on the altar and allow God to give them back to you. That's it. But they no longer own you. They no longer determine your level of freedom or joy or understanding or even self-awareness. These things can actually cloud your self-awareness. Well, I'm a this, I'm a this, I'm a this, I'm a this. And here's my justification for me being on this planet. When you, when those things are taken off or at least put on the altar for a little while, that's where I think the beauty can really come in. Here's what I would say to a pastor if we're having coffee talking about this. We cannot forget the goodness of God. The truth of the matter is, and I've seen it in my own life, but I've seen it in the lives of a lot of other people as well who have laid those things on the altar either voluntarily or involuntarily. It's only so God can give you more. Not more of what puts you in bondage, but more peace, more joy, more understanding. So you can steward these things, but they aren't, you're not beholden to them anymore. You steward them for the glory of God. And maybe that's oversimplifying it, but I think that there's something very valuable to that process and understanding that it's just God just wants to bless you more with things that you don't think, feel like you deserve to have. You know, so I think that's 100% accurate. So let's go back to the book, Pray 21, not that I'm hawking the book, Pray 21. It's a great book. You should hawk it. It's good. Well, it was simple, right? You say I'm oversimplifying it. So that book was written as a result of sitting in Portland, Oregon airport, missing a flight and I'm waiting till the next morning. So sitting in one of those really comfortable airport terminal chairs and, uh, you know, just we can lay out and stretch because it's so cushy, like, a you know, lazy boy. And so like one, two in the morning, I'm sitting next to a, a individual. I, I really don't know well at all. We had just spoke at the same event. And he asked me a really simple question. Who are you? And I did what every one of us do. Well, I'm a pastor. I'm the president of this. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm, I want, you know, your education, your experience, and your expertise, right? Mm-hmm. As if that's my identity. And that's why I think what you said is so critical. Because it's identity. And he looked at me and he says, nope, you're wrong. And I thought, I mean, I'm wrong. I know exactly. Those are all true things. Those are all true statements. My business card says so. (laughs) He said, that's not it. And so I tried to answer it again in a different way. And he goes, that's not who you are. And I should have known this answer because it's such a simple answer. And so I got on a plane without him telling me who I am, really confused and perplexed. And it was weeks later where I had a conversation on the phone with the guy. And he said, listen, I asked you such a simple question. You're a son of the most high God. That's who you are. Well, you said this earlier, David, that's enough. When that's not enough, we begin to supplement our insecurities right. with our titles in our roles until that takes over. And that's a miserable place to exist from. So that's why I wrote Pray 21. And of everything I've written, I think it's actually the most powerful book I've ever read because it's only about prayer. 
Mm -hmm. Submit yourself to me in prayer. Answer these questions in this book on chapter whatever it was, you know, in your life. And listen to the Lord and submit it to him. And when we finally get to the point where our title is no longer our identity, and I talk about this a lot in the, the, the modules in the Authentic Pastor course, to the point where people will get tired of hearing it. Your identity is not your title. Your identity is not your role. Your identity is not even your calling. And, and right. there's no there's no question that I get a little uh, annoyed when we put so much emphasis on our calling. Listen, your calling is important, but your calling is to Christ. You're in pastoral ministry because of your giftings, not your calling. If you separate those out, there's freedom and liberty in that as well, which prevents us from, you know, thinking that our calling is a, in pastoral life is above our calling to our life in Christ. And I think that's where our identity gets skewed mm -hmm. is because we're more concerned with our calling to the pulpit, our calling to ministry, than we are calling as a son or daughter of the Most High God, born with birthrights that cannot be taken away, regardless of the circumstances and the valleys and the, you know, the long dark nights and the dark nights of the soul that we have. Yeah. Yeah. And, but the, you know, you and I both know, and I, I've been guilty of saying it when I'm preaching to students in, in times past, at least, you all are world changers, right? And boy, that preach is great. And you can get the crowd to just foam at the mouth on statements like that. But that's kind of dangerous, man. I, I, it's funny. I read this devotional this morning and it was talking about there's people who perform heroic acts and then there's heroes. And the point that he was making was we all long for those moments where we jump, you know, over buildings and save the woman and or whatever that is, right? All this superhero stuff. But a hero is someone who is just perfectly content and living from that place in an ordinary way. And I think that that is somewhat of what we're trying to say here. I think it's so. The call, the, the calling is the heroic acts, right? It's the lights, the people seeing and applauding, and those are... But a hero, a true hero, is someone who is fine exactly being that, sweeping the garage floor. Yeah. It's what, I say, it's what I say about authenticity when people go, what are the marks of authenticity? What's the definition of authenticity? It's kind of the same thing you're saying. It's when I'm authentic, like, I don't need a crowd. I don't need applause. I don't need a memory. I don't need to remember what I said. I don't need to look over my shoulder at who's watching. I'm just being. I'm just being who God designed me to be. Yeah. And I don't need you to notice. And I don't need to care what you think about me. And again, we've talked about this briefly. I mean, I do care because I want to have influence in your life. Not because I mm -hmm. need you to think I'm all that in a bag of chips. If I have influence in your life, then I can maybe guide you through a more authentic place in your relationship with Christ as well. And as long as I need that accolade, recognition, I'm never going to be as effective in pastoral life as I could be. And so that takes us back to self-awareness to be able to admit and figure out what my motivation is. And if my motivation is anything other than I'm comfortable being who I am and God designed me to be, then I need to really take some effort to figure out how do I take a break? You just took a break. You just took a three month sabbatical. Mm -hmm. And, um, which is self care, not self awareness, self care. But sometimes in self care, we find self awareness. Yeah. I'm not sure in general. I'm learning a lot about self care. And um, I'm learning that I'm pretty bad at it. I'm getting better because I put everybody else's needs in front of my own because I'm a pastor. And that's what we do. We sacrifice. 
We're servants, mm -hmm. but we sacrifice our own health. We sacrifice our own authenticity. We supplement for our insecurities by caring for everybody else first before we actually understand that it's biblical to put myself first. Only then can I care for my neighbor. What did you learn in your sabbatical about you, David? Well, the first thing I would tell you is uh, I learned that I need to get better at camping outdoors. Um, so you ready for an authentic story that's not deep at all? So I'm in a tent. I'm in Moab. So after you and I hung out for a couple of days in Colorado, I get in my car. I go out to Moab for three days. And, uh, you know, you're camping out. This is my first time. I'm 50. Well, I'm actually 51 at the time. I was This past summer, I was 50 and never camped out before in my life. And so I was just working out the whole bathroom thing, right? What do you do in the middle of the night? A 50-year-old guy has to pee. And so I started with some prototypes, but I need something that had was a little bit more forgiving in terms of a receptacle that didn't require like surgeon level precision. Okay? Prototypes. Yeah. So I started with a, a smart water bottle and then graduated up to something a little bit more robust. Okay. So I'm in Moab for three days, drinking smart waters like it's going out of style, pack up my bags, pack up my stuff throw all my trash away, and then I go to the Grand Canyon. Now I'm camping out there for a couple of days on the sabbatical. This isn't the front end, right after I saw you, dude. And uh, I'm out there. I wake up in the middle of the night. It's 3% humidity out in the Grand Canyon in the summertime. So you're, you're constantly dehydrated. I wake up in the middle of the night, have to use the restroom, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm so freaking thirsty. So I reach over, I grab a bottle of water, and I just slam. I take a huge pull off that thing. Um. One thing that I learned at my sabbatical is always check the water bottle because I had accidentally, <laughs> I had accidentally packed one of the old bottles from Utah and dude, I freaking drink and, and I couldn't throw it up either, man. I, I, I retread, I put a retread on that one, man. So, well, you know, they say like in your survival mode, you know, you can drink your own urine. So Joe. Sarah, my wife said, well, you were just bare grills. And I'm like, dude, uh, the bare grill is nasty, man. Um, so that's that's one of the things that I learned on my sabbatical. Um, okay. All right. Well, that was different than I was thinking, but that is actually a very, pr if you're listening and you're thinking about going camping, then please take that word of wisdom from David Martin. Pay attention to the water bottle that you're using. Um, it, it So when I was at the Grand Canyon, to, to take it a little bit more meaningful, um, there was a couple of things. Well, one thing in particular that, I had just not forgiven myself for since I was a teenager. And it wasn't anything horrendous that I had done. It was just a regret that kind of shaped my how I saw my marriage, saw my relationship. It, it really did a number on me. And I, and I felt like throughout the course of the years, if anything went sideways with my relationship with my wife, um, the enemy would bring up this particular series of choices I made relationally with someone else. And it, and it was just, it was foregone. And what the Lord showed me in that season was, man, that, no, don't, don't do that. Don't allow this to continue to speak into your life. It's actually a lie. And I could have sworn it was true for 30 years. And so that was something that the Lord just reached in and pulled out of my, out of my spirit. Um, from a pastoral standpoint, really, the thing that I struggled with the most was before I went on sabbatical and it was this, and I, and I understand how arrogant it sounds. And I also understand how it sounds so counter to everything we've just said for the last couple of minutes. My challenge was God said, do a sabbatical. I said, okay, God, here's the thing. Our church is growing post COVID. We're finally seeing this happen financially, numerically, we're hiring staff. Everything is moving forward. Got a lot of new faces on our team. This is the worst time to take a sabbatical and take three months off. And I told my wife, Sarah, I said, "Hun, if I'm being honest, I'm afraid that people will stop coming because I'm not there to preach. I understand. I get how arrogant that sounds, but I'm just being honest. I was fearful that if I'm gone for three months, I'll kill the church. And Sarah said something really, this was the lesson. She said, listen to the way you talk. She said, this is the reason why pastors burn out. This is the reason why pastors never take sabbaticals is because there's never a good time. 
And in that moment, the Holy Spirit said, David, I'm going to prove that this is a spirit-led church, not a David Martin-led church. And your absence is going to prove that. And then I was like, I'm done. Great. I'm out. So that was something huge for me that he gave me on the front end. So it really was an exercise in just realizing that I'm not a special. Um, and so clearly there's more things that God has to work out in my spirit, but I'm not a special and as, as important as I thought I was. And that was a good thing. And guess what it has afforded me now that I'm back is greater freedom, greater freedom. And guess what? Numbers continued to grow. Giving was at an all time high. It defied summer numbers. It was ridiculous. And I wasn't there and I had nothing to do with that. Yeah. <laughs> so. No, that's, um, I think that's the most relevant aspect of self-care that I'm learning. I spend more time in my life, like I serve on committees and different things for prayer and the National Day of Prayer and stuff like that. I don't know why, you know, the people who are on the committee all write books on prayer uh, most of the time I sit there and think, I don't even know if I like to pray, you know, just being honest. What I have learned in the last year, for me, I spend more time in meditation and silence. And people get all wigged out when I use the word meditation, you know, as if it's unbiblical that we actually spend time being still and knowing that he is God. And um, so that's what I mean when I say meditation. I I, I empty my mind and ask God to fill it up as I begin a half hour. And now my half hour stretches into 45 minutes. And now my 45 minutes stretches into an hour. I have to set an alarm on my phone to stop being silent before God now. And if I don't do that, and I was actually thinking about that this morning. I'm thinking, you know, the last couple of weeks, you've been crazy busy. I've been traveling. I was in Peru with my kids. We were climbing mountains and doing all kinds of memory making stuff. And I realized this morning, sitting in my chair at six o'clock in my living room, that you have not been silent before the Lord in about a week. And I was mm -hmm. feeling the weight of it. But for the first time, probably one of the first times in my life, and especially my pastoral career, not of ob obligation and guilt. I've got to do my quiet time in the morning. I've got to be in God's word every morning. In a lot of my life, I've been in God's word and been quiet and been in prayer with the Lord because I'm supposed to. It's part of my job. It's my title. By God, I'm a pastor. It's my calling. This morning it was, I'm feeling like Tim is not the best version of himself right now. And not because the Lord is telling me, get in prayer, get in quiet, get in silence. It's because I've learned that it's in that self-care time that he speaks the most. It's my daily walk that I'm trying to do. It's my daily swim. It's my workout time. It's going home at four o'clock with stuff hmm. left on my desk. Because if I finish it all today, I'm not worth killing when I get home to my wife. Mm -hmm. And I'm learning that I can take care of myself. God expects me to take care of myself. And when I don't take care of myself, what I'm telling the Lord is, you can't do it without me, Jack. You can't do it without me. The church will fall apart. The world will fall apart. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got to post. I've got to say something meaningful. I've got to have the perfect sermon. I mean, I'm all about preparation. But that's really the inauthenticity in me saying, I have to be more than a son of God. I can't afford to be, to care for myself. I can't afford a sabbatical. And so just your testimony of the health of the church in your absence. We all have a testimony like that's not true. We don't all have a testimony like that. Some of us have a testimony like that. Some of us are still learning that. That's what I mean by authenticity. I think that's part of the lesson I'm trying to, to teach in this project. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, again, I'm not putting words in your mouth. I think that's why um, even this topic in the last couple of months of us just chatting back and forth about it um, excites you because maybe we both experienced the opposite. 
We have it, absolutely. Um, we're, I feel a heart more now than ever for pastors because I, I've walked a lot of their paths um, in, in this regard. And to have this conversation, if there is, you know, for those who are, who are engaging in, in this project you're doing, which I think is tremendous, because not only is it going to bless the pastor, but it's going to bless the hundreds or thousands that they lead. Um, and then there's the compound interest of this investment and those that they disciple up the road. You'll never get credit for half the stuff that they're going to pass on, and it doesn't matter. But we, we both know the weight and the mantle of this position, leading at these levels as pastor, responsible for a congregation, responsible for all the business of the church and contracts and loans and payroll and all that kind of stuff, man. But what I would say to, to what you just said, if I was talking to a pastor, is that what you and I are discussing has been, we have gone through the fire. But here's what I can promise anybody listening who just goes, man, I don't know where to start with this. This is what I would tell them. The great news is, is that the need to be a compelling preacher on Sunday morning, the need to be a super leader on Monday morning and staff meeting, all of those things are your responsibility, right? But when we realize it's not our weight to carry mm -hmm. and we're invited into those things, we're drawing from the source, which is God, but we're not doing it because we have to, or we have to keep this thing moving. This is what kills pastors, man. This is why we see suicide rates starting to spike amongst pastors is because they feel that this spoken and unspoken aspect of their elders, their deacons, their congregations, their own hurts and wounds, the, all that stuff to keep this thing going and go bigger, better, more awesome. And the truth is, is that we can never fall under that expectation. We, we have to make sure we stay way far away from it. Our job is to simply say yes to God. Lord, I'm your herald. What do you want to say this coming Sunday? I don't care if it makes people mad, happy, sad, or repentant. Irrelevant. We're hit. We have to understand our role and our position in this. Once, I'm speaking for myself, there is great liberty in that. And so I, God can take this away at any point. I just wanted to be said of David that I was faithful, faithful to what God gave me. The results, the responses, the outcomes are not ours. They, they don't, and I don't own them. I don't own them. And so I do my best and then he's going to have to bless it. And it almost sounds like it becomes a faith-based ministry again. Oh, imagine. <laughs> imagine. Well, what a what, concept. What a concept, right? What a concept. I would say as we put a bow on it. Authenticity has to start with an awareness that God is bigger than you. It sounds really trite, but I, I would hope people listening would wrestle with that because sometimes our actions prove that we don't believe it even if we preach it. You can take time to take care of yourself without neglecting your needs, your loved ones, and your ministry because God's got it under control. And when we can start doing that, I think those issues of inauthenticity will emerge and allow us to take care of them one at a time, and God will prove himself to be faithful in your ministry and life more than maybe you've ever experienced to truly understand what it means that it is for freedom that Paul writes in Galatians that we have been set, we've been set free. So thanks for listening to David and I ramble. It's been good for me, man. It's and, been good for me too. Just because, I mean, you. we don't see each other near enough. And so, you know, while this isn't the big David hug and squeeze that I'm going to get, it's it's going to carry me. It's going to carry me through for a little bit. But, hey, go to theauthenticpastor.com. You can continue the conversation, look and see what we offer. And um, our goal is you. It's all about you. It's not about church growth. It's not about leadership. It's not being a better speaker. It's about being a better you. 
You make me a better me, David Martin. Thank you so much. Likewise, man. It was my pleasure. Love you. Love you, buddy.